Welcome to Earth Chapters, hosted by Pollinator Friendly Alliance. You can find us at pollinatorfriendly.org. Pollinator Friendly Alliance is a grassroots nonprofit powered by the enthusiasm of our partners and volunteers to protect the natural world, pollinators, and their habitats. Remember, everything in the natural world is connected. An ecosystem is a community of living things that work together and rely upon the other. Let's be good stewards of the ecosystem. Today's chapter four of Earth Chapters is Ecological Regenerative Lawns with Bob Dom and How Do We Save Endangered Pollinators with Eric Runquist. So let's get started. Yeah, well, welcome everyone. It's great to have such a good turnout um, on a kind of chilly day, spring day in Minnesota. And to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm Bob Dom. I'm one of the owners of Organic Bob. And we do organic lawn care and alternative turf installations all over the metro area. And I, I grew up on a farm in Iowa. And I watched my dad and grandfather and a brother all die of cancer, um, somewhat linked or directly linked to the use of agricultural chemicals. And years later, I was in charge of grounds for a children's psychiatric hospital. And uh, the playground looked terrible because I was refusing to put any chemicals on it. And after three years of organic methods, uh, the playground looked better than the rest of the grounds that we were doing with chemicals. And that was in 1986. So I've been on a mission ever since. But today we'll talk about the ecologically regenerative lawn. And yeah, with that, we'll, we'll jump right in. Oh, how do I... So... Lawn as the problem. Now, expanses of lawn like this just are kind of scary to me because I know what it takes for inputs and the amount of water it takes that washes a lot of those inputs off and uh, the chemicals will stress and kill pollinators and the water is polluted. Um, and monocultures are, they're basically artificial ecologies and they just need a lot of inputs. Oop, wrong way. So the secret is to work less and regenerate more. So less mowing will actually give you less weeds. And less watering means you mow less. Uh, less fertilizer, less air pollution. The fertilizer, the synthetic fertilizers have a tremendous energy footprint. They're basically mining the air for nitrogen and, and, and then mining the earth for other elements. So, and the, the greater the diversity in our lawns, the greater the diversity in our soil and the more pollinators we'll have and the deeper the roots, the more it will infiltrate water. Uh, the root zone is basically the aquifer of the soil and grass is notoriously short rooted, you know, it's, it's several inches. Whereas native plants are, you know, dozens of feet deep in root depth. So, and then in order to have a, an ecologically regenerative lawn, the the first absolute must is a lawn must be organic. Uh, chemicals are a major ecological disruption, especially at a microbial level. They'll kill off uh, beneficial microbes and all you're left with are the anaerobic organisms and those actually cause weeds. So the chemicals end up causing the very problems that they're supposed to take care of. And you need to do them again and again and again. And the more you use them, the more the soil is less able 
to fight off things like weeds and disease on its own. And then the cost to water, uh, groundwater in particular, is uh, just staggering the amount of chemicals that, that filter into our drinking water. And so how you go organic, um, this is a very simplified schedule, but, and we do all of these things. Um, you overseed with fine fescue grass seed, and the fine fescues are the ones that they call no-mow fescue. Um, and the, as the name implies, you don't have to mow it. And it, it gets about six to eight inches long, and it, then it just lays over, it quits growing, and it, it's beautiful. It looks like guinea pig hair. So you get these swirls of, of green. And, and then the, the, the next thing we do is a, a top dressing of compost. And if you have a high quality compost, you don't need very much compost maybe 150 pounds over a thousand square feet. And then we fertilize spring and fall with the certified organic phosphorus free fertilizer. And then you mow it at three inches or higher. And that mowing height is very important. Um, at three inches or higher, the grass plant doesn't feel threatened. So it puts all of its growth energy into the roots and less into the leaf uh, because it, it eats with that leaf. It does photosynthesis with the leaf. So if that gets too short, it feels threatened and then it, the, it becomes thin and you expose soil and that's where weed seeds come in. Plus the three inch mowing height will shade the soil and you use less water. So in order for a lawn to be ecologically regenerative, it has to be diverse. You need to work in other species like the, the pussy toes in this picture. Uh, monocultures cannot regenerate. You just need, the more species of plants in the plant community, the better off you are. And that's why prairies are so amazing. There's just, hundreds of species in a small, small area. And, and this diversity will create healthy soil. And the soil health is, is key uh, to all of this. If your soil is healthy, your lawn will be healthy, and it's easier to get a healthy soil if, you're, if you have that diversity. Because every organism, every plant will choose or develop the microbes that support them. So they'll be very diverse with a diverse group of plants. And bluethumb.org, they have a lot of information on turf alternatives. Uh, and there's also um, information there on healthy soil. And I have more resources at the end. So Plant diversity, now the U of M uh, Bee Lab de developed these bee lawns, and that's what this picture is. Um, and the, it's a blend, there's the base plant are the normal fescues, but there's creeping thyme, self-heal, and Dutch white clover. And so they're designed to be blooming almost the entire season. And so, and they're, they feed a wide variety of bees. There's 400 or so species of bees in Minnesota and many more pollinators that will all be feeding on this lawn. And the, the nice thing about this is, is that um, it feeds pollinators where there isn't food typically in a lawn. So the other thing for a regenerative lawn, they just have to be smaller. Um, and if you have plantings around the edge like this, where you, you, know, you get the diversity off the lawn as well as in the lawn. So an ecologically regenerative lawn is a smaller lawn. And it, you can be very strategic about the areas that you, you shrink. So like boulevards, terrible place for a lawn. Deep shade, horrible, grass needs, four hours of 
bright sunlight a day or it's going to be thin and prone to weeds. And then uh, steep slopes, especially those facing south and west, uh, the species of grass in our lawns, none of them, uh, with the exception of one of the fine fescues, is native. The rest of them evolved in northern Europe, northern Asia, and the climates they evolved in are like England, where they don't get our temperature extremes, and they get about twice the amount of water that we get. So that's why everybody has to water their lawn so much, because you know, it's a thirsty plant, and Kentucky bluegrass is a very hungry plant, too. And the fine fescues, because they're deeper rooted, um, they require less water, and they aren't as heavy of feeders, so you can get by with much less um, fertilizer. So on here, again, the small lawn is, is key. So the key here to, to all of this is to regenerate the soil. Now this photograph shows um, fungal hyphae or uh, mycorrhizal fungi attached on the roots of plants. Now this is so cool. What these fungi do is they, they attach onto the root of a plant and they feed on the carbohydrates that plants overproduce in photosynthesis and they put those extra carbs in the soil <laughs> and the, the fungi feed on these and they can tell by what they're getting what the plant needs. So they'll say, you know, Mr. Old Growth Cedar, you need some calcium. And they go out through this fungal network and gather calcium and bring it back with water and feed it to the host plant. <coughs> and the plants know this, so they send these signals. And they can actually even um, form networks hooking up with other plants of various species immediately close to them. So grass will form some of these associations, but native plants form even more, uh, woody plants still more. And the cool thing is, is that annual and biennial weeds don't form these associations. So if you get the soil more fungal, you're gonna have fewer weeds because they won't be able to compete. So think of this kind of fungi as kind of a smart root for the plants. And this, this is how pollinators see lawns, the, the traditional lawn. They're a desert. There's nothing there for them to eat. There's not much there in the way of habitat or shelter. And some of these little bees can barely have a range of half a mile or, or even less. So for them to go across a lawn, a big lawn, would be like me driving to Topeka to get lunch. You know, it's just, it's, it's a long ways and some days I'm just not gonna make it. So, and then you end up with these pockets of pollinators that, you know, the, they, well, kind of reminds me of uh, some of the farming communities I was in where there just wasn't enough genetic diversity. So there's that. And then lawns must be networked. So lawns to legumes program through bluethumb.org decided to strategically con connect these habitat islands so that the pollinators could achieve genetic diversity. And this plan was developed by the Bureau of Water and Soil Resources and the legislature earmarked $900,000 for education and cost share grants and Blue Thumb is administering those cost share grants and doing a fair amount of the education. So if you want more information on how to put in a pollinator patch or a meadow or a bee lawn on your lawn uh, and get some help paying for it, that's where you need to go is bluethumb.org. So host plants need host microbes. 
Now, this is a classic example of the monarch and the milkweed, the close association they have. And the same is true below ground. There are microbe communities that will support one kind of plant and then they'll vary a little bit for another kind of plant. But plants more or less select and maintain their soil microbiome. Uh, and this is done through you know, millennia of evolution where they know which ones they need. They, you know, it's like all of us have our friends, our besties, and these are, they're no exception. So, and then a lawn with a small footprint. Um, you can sequester more carbon with the greater root mass, either of the, the diversity in the lawn or the plantings around it, and then less fossil fuels with no synthetic fertilizers. And here's a very simple plan. If you wanna have a lot of impact in your lawn for a little bit of money, you overseed it with clover, plant some pollinator pocket gardens around the edges or prairie grass and call it good. You've eliminated that island effect. And if your neighbors or their neighbors do the same thing, then there's, there's a lot more room for these pollinators to move around in. Or if you have a very large property, put a prairie on it and you just seed into this, the existing vegetation and quit mowing for two years or mow it at four inches or higher. And then at the end, at the beginning of the third year, you stop mowing and the prairie, which has spent two years putting roots down, will just pop up out of nothing and it'll, you'll have a prairie overnight. Uh, weed control on a lawn, you want to get control of invasive weeds before you do uh, bee lawn seeding. So Fiesta herbicide, it's very, very low toxicity. It's, um, it's actually safe for aquatic invertebrates. And it comes from Canada where they've outlawed all um, traditional lawn chemicals. So there's, that'd be a recommendation. And it does handle Creeping Charlie. And then how to add diversity. Um, I see I'm kind of pushing the time here, but uh, you aerate, you top dress, seed, fertilize, and you do this in mid-August to mid-September. Or if you want to just start over, uh, remove that existing turf, till in a half inch of compost, fertilizer seed, and then use a netless blanket and the best results in the bee lawns is doing this as a dormant seeding when the trees are losing their leaves. Solarizing, now the Xerxes Society recommends clear plastic to germinate the weed seeds. And you can see that's what's happening under this plastic. Uh, at the bottom edge, there's that little uh, bit of growth underneath the plastic that's all purslane that was um, germinated and then it would die uh, under that plastic. And sheet composting, which I'll be giving a talk on this on the 30th, but you spray molasses water over, a thin layer of compost, two layers of cardboard, a couple of inches of topsoil, put down fertilizer and then seed, and then uh, netless blanket over that also. And here are some resources that I'll leave up, but I believe, yeah, that's, that's the last slide. So the last one will have my contact information. So that's it, Lori, if there's any, what's next? Well, so much great information, Bob. Can you hear me, everybody? Um, and Bob, as he mentioned, will be back on April 30th as well to talk more in more depth about soil, healthy soil. Um, we got a lot of really great, great questions from you all, which we will be posing to Bob at the end of the talk today. 
So um, thank you, Bob. And you can stop sharing your screen. And we're going to welcome Eric Runquist from the Minnesota Zoo. Everybody. You can see my screen now. I can hear you and I can see your screen. Look. Excellent. Thank you. Shoot. Well, um, this is great to be here. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Lori and Bob, for organizing this. Um, so I get paid, amazingly, to chase butterflies. <laughs> there aren't many of the, those sort of jobs out there, but um, it is possible. Um, and unfortunately, it's increasingly necessary because many of them are also now endangered. Um, and so I'm going to talk about my role at the Minnesota Zoo on, on some of the, the tools that are, that are useful for, um, for helping to save endangered species. Um, and I'll just add that it's, it's, it's not a, an easy prospect. Um, so again, I work at the Minnesota Zoo as a, as a butterfly conservation biologist and really now pollinator conservation biologist. The mission of the zoo is to connect people, animals, and the natural world to save wildlife. Um, and these are in increasingly difficult times to try to connect people to animals, <laughs> um, particularly, you know, have those sorts of unique moments where you can closely engage with a tiger or, or, or watch animals um, from around the world that you would never really have exposure to. Um, um, we're at a, a point in, in society where we are being increasingly disconnected from the natural world. And so being outside is, is a huge piece of this. Um, but also working then at the zoo, a, a large part of what we need to be doing is not just making those connections, but then also reaching and, and forming actions. We can do some of those through, through the zoo, and I'll talk about some of those. But um, really, it, the, there's a lot of important connections that need to be made through collective action. So um, again, these are difficult times to sort of make those connections with the zoo being closed for the indefinite future. Um, and that's, that's, being, uh, that's obviously painful for a lot of people. Um, you might hear a toddler in the background, for example, here. <laughs> um, I'll try to, you know, be careful on that. But, you know, we are, we are all sort of living in a unique world right now. Um, and with the zoo closed, we are trying to create and foster some of those connections uh, through the virtual zoo currently. Uh, we've developed a lot of online resources for education um, that actually conform with Minnesota education standards. Um, and our large uh, annual farm babies exhibit obviously has to now be virtual too, and there's some adorable webcams and there's a naming contest for some you know, baby animals and things like that. But um, Certainly, we're, we're trying, and this is a, a, an interesting time to be participating. Um, so go check out some of those, those resources we've got here. Um, but like I said, I am, I'm a conservation biologist by training, an entomologist by training, um, and really our, the major focus of my program is focusing on two endangered species of butterflies. The first is the Dakota skipper. Um, it's classified as a threatened species in the US, but it's Minnesota endangered and also classified as endangered under the global red species list of, of endangered species under the uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. There's a male here on the left and a female on the right. Um, and these were photographed by Joel Sartori with the National Geographic Society, who's created this amazing photo art project trying to capture unique diversity before it disappears. Um, and so we, we are, we've been very honored to have him a couple times. Um, I'm gonna guess a lot of you have not heard of the Dakota Skipper, but I'm, I'm happy to say that in the few years that I've been working on this program, more and more people are identifying skippers and coming to me and, and I'm, I'm very excited about that. Historically, the Dakota Skipper had this range that uh, probably stretched um, kind of in this white area from an old record near Chicago, and we know all of, all of them, um, and they extend then up into Saskatchewan. Minnesota was, was right in the middle of that range in the prairies. Um, all those red dots, or, or all those dots period, are places that we knew they existed, and certainly they had to be much more widespread across that historic range. Um, 
A lot of the red dots though, those are all spots that we think it's gone. Um, the yellow dots, we're suspecting they're gone. And the green dots are the only ones we know are, are still existing. And that might still be an overestimation. So in Minnesota, um, so we think it's gone from at least three fourths of all the locations we knew it used to be at. Um, Minnesota, we probably only have one location for sure left. Um, and, we, and we think it's gone in the southern portion of its range. The Powashik Skipperling. If you're gonna remember one butterfly today, remember this one. Um, this is a, classified as endangered at the US level, at the Minnesota state level, and is critically endangered at the international level. Um, which means that it's um, right up there with some of the most endangered species in the world. Um, it had a, the core of its range used to actually be in Minnesota. We had about at least half of the global records um, and it's now gone from basically all of that range, except for some little spots in Manitoba and little spots in Michigan. So it's gone from the core of its range. And this is uh, where the, the heart of the, the tall grass prairie, the northern tall grass prairies. And if you add up the number of individuals seen in Manitoba and in Michigan through time, over the last, you know, per year, you might, uh, you might only reach 50 or 100 or 200 individuals. So we're, we're probably talking about a global population in the low hundreds for a butterfly that was boringly common just two decades ago. Um, so it collapsed hard and fast. So this makes Powashiks, for example, way more endangered than a giant panda, which most people might think of as, as kind of an iconic endangered species. There's about 6,000 giant pandas in the wild, but maybe only 500 Powashik. So these are our pandas actually worse than pandas. Indeed, they're on about the same level that, that bison were uh, but over 100 years ago when there were just a couple hundred individuals left. So it's a really sad, desperate situation for this once very common butterfly. Um, but in, unfortunately, it's also, they're not the only ones. Um, and indeed, at, at the Minnesota state level, there are actually 15 butterflies listed as endangered, threatened, or special concern. Um, Ten of those actually are prairie dependents. And unfortunately, eight of those are probably already gone in Minnesota. So we know a lot about the butterflies, but we know next to nothing about most of the other pollinators, for example. So these are the only, these are kind of our flagship critters. So again, these are prairie butterflies, um, and they are telling us, a, the recent disappearances are telling us a lot about what other things are going on at the same time. There's a really rich prairie butterfly fauna that is in real trouble. Many species are declining, including some of the common ones. Um, and of course, these are representative of, of some of the larger ecosystem dynamics. And if we can figure out how to make better prairie for these butterflies, that's going to bring a lot of other things along at the same time. Um, the Prairie Butterfly Conservation Program at the Minnesota Zoo then was formed in 2012, and this is a, a growing partnership. And every year, and then we have to add more and more logos to this, which is which is a which is a neat thing to be showing um, a growth of a, a partnership and a lot of important actors helping out here. Um, so, what can be done? I'll talk more about some of what we're doing at the zoo in a minute, but. Um, there's there's really four big areas that I'd like to highlight. So the first one is well, obviously we need to know what's going on in the wild, um, and that's going to be a complicated situation. So the loss of the prairie is a big deal, with only about one percent of it left. Um, so that's definitely going to hinder our ability to, um, you know, have populations surviving long term if they're just stuck in little pieces of prairie and those prairies are 15 miles apart. Um, we know we have other problems like invasive, invasive grasses, like in here on the upper left, um, is smooth brome is choking out a lot of the native diversity. Um, a lot of those prairies, like I said, are highly fragmented, um, and almost all of them have, have bordered, are bordered on, on at least one side by large scale root crop agriculture, which is not necessarily to point a bad finger at them, but there's, there, as we are finding in some of our research, there's, there's some spillover even if unintentional. Um, we worry about climate change. Um, it, a lot of winters are increasingly snow free out on the prairies and we know snow is a terrific insulator of, 
uh, things that are living on the ground through the winter and as are the, the caterpillars of these butterflies. So what that really requires is us doing a lot of surveys out in the wilds, not only looking for these rare butterflies and rare pollinators, but then also keeping an eye on all the other species that, are, that might be common now, but like Powashik was two decades ago, might be falling off the face of the earth very quickly. So we got to understand the characteristics and the threats that are going on in the wild. That's step one. That's, that's, that's a whole lot of research built onto one slide that's needed. Two, um, and this is where a lot of my role comes in at the Minnesota Zoo through ex situ management. So ex situ means management of, of conservation in a way that's out of the wild. You might have a series of threats that then lead to declining populations, that fragment populations, um, and that leads to a bunch of, of feedback loops of uh, low reproduction and, and survival. Um, lots of things feeding in there that can then build, be building in populations into an extinction vortex. And once they get into that vortex, it's super hard to get them back out of there. And that can lead to extinction of the wild and then ultimately species extinction. So in green here on the right side of the slide, we've got a, a, a number of ex situ options that, that can be taken. Um, and those are involving varying degrees of, of intensive management. So um, say zoo-based um, breeding for, for uh, rare lineages or trying to preserve a population uh, or at least certain genetics or you might be able to do create a, a population at the zoo and then do, use those as a source for reintroductions in the wild and population restoration. Um, way more there that I can go in into in this short time frame. Uh, that is to say these are some options they're not the only options and they don't have to be one of these options either to help save endangered species. If it's if it, it we're able to help restore species in the wild through wild restorations only, that's cool. Um, but these are one of the many possible tools in the toolkit. And so there's actually very intensive and, and long um, planning processes that we've gone through for both of our species. For what we're doing with Dakota skippers and Powashik, um, there's a couple things. One, uh, so here's a female Dakota skipper sitting on a cone flower out in the prairie. Um, one thing that we're doing at the Minnesota Zoo is then creating an insurance pot. And that means we're trying to, to save some of those genetics in case of further declines. So we will, under very strict protocols, um, so we're not doing anything negative to the population, we might be able to collect that female, hold on to her for a couple of days, collect some of her eggs, those are those little white dots there in that cup, um, and then let her go back out where we got her in the first place so she can continue to lay eggs in the wild. And then those eggs are brought back to the Minnesota Zoo where we rear them up and create a new population. Um, here's an adorable little high-speed video of Dakota skippers eating and just hatching out of their eggs for the very first time. Their first meal is actually the egg, their egg case. Um, and this is one of the more sensitive stages, uh, but luckily we've been able to have pretty good success with this. And there's a, as you can probably infer, the one on the upper left there, there's another caterpillar coming out and they're just about to hatch. So that happens thousands of times a year at the zoo. And then we plant those, we, we put those larvae onto individual plants um, and mostly rearing those outside. Uh, so in the, it, when we're at peak productivity, we've got many, many hundreds of caterpillars going on simultaneously. And that's a major operation of taking care of all of those. Um, then, after a year, we then have um, adults coming out. So they have a one-year lifespan. Sorry, that pause there. <clears throat> Look in the middle of the screen. There's a little movement happening. This is where we need um, <clears throat> David Attenborough to be giving us an narration on uh, the hatching of a Dakota skipper. This had never been filmed before, emerging from its chrysalis. <clears throat> Pretty cool. So there's a male that had just come out <clears throat> that'll, over the next hour or so, he will be inflating his wings. <clears throat> then on the left, behind that kind of moving shade of uh, bladed grass is another female that emerged a little bit earlier. <coughs> So then, excuse me, we might be able to, to then um, 
conduct that multiple times over the years, and we've had a, a large, now successful breeding program. Um, but it, that's that's great. But one of the the tools that's really needed is is uh, sustaining of populations in the wild, and and reestablishing them in populations in the wild. So, for Dakota skippers, this involves reintroductions, and for Powashik, <coughs> excuse me. Um, that involves a head starting program where we try to support populations in the wild. <clears throat> so this, uh, for the last three years, we've been doing reintroductions of Dakota skippers, trying to reestablish them at a, a prairie in southwest Minnesota. And if you actually look at my uh, my background on my my personal here, my personal screen, that's the prairie we're actually doing the reintroductions into. So we release adults daily um, as they're emerging, and we're happy to report that we're seeing a lot of the, those successful signs of what they need to be doing in the wild, and that includes breeding. So we are confirming that they are sort of reestablishing that system of, of, of population, and fingers crossed, um, we've, uh, we'll have we start reestablishing a population. This was the first breeding observed in southwest Minnesota for Dakota skippers in about a decade, which is pretty cool. Um, but surely there's a lot more of that's going that is going to be needed for that in the long term. I'm happy to say then the Powashik Zipperling, uh, there we're trying to prop up the last populations in the world. So Dakota skippers are doing okay, and, and there we're trying to get dots back on the map. For Dakota for Powashik Zipperling, we're trying to not lose the last dots. Um, and so we're trying to then release, we're bringing in releasing adults then back out into the Michigan populations and our partners at the Assiniboine Parks in Winnipeg are doing the same thing, trying to prop up the only Canadian populations. And I'm happy to report we currently have 70 Powashik at the Minnesota Zoo right now. And that might be a fifth of the global population in our care. So no pressure to try to support that. So those, those are some possible ex situ options, but there's, there's gotta be more. Um, that, that can never be the only solution. That's all, there are only maybe stop gaps or part of, the, part of the solution. So the third big pillar here is responsible stewardship. And as Bob just talked about, we need to be moving out of the idea of a simple lawn ecosystem for most of our environment most that we interact with. We need to be forming, finding ways to connect and create habitat. Uh, as an example, then for the at the Minnesota Zoo, we had some lawns that were wrapped around some of our parking lots. We removed those and installed wildflower gardens, and those have been wildly, wildly beautiful over the years and have attracted huge amounts of pollinators. Um, <clears throat> and part of that is then is, is creating outreach for this. Um, we can talk about the diversity of native plants. We can talk about the the pollinators that are attracted to them and some of the useful tools for that. So we've got a plant guide. There's so many plant guides out there that are, that are fabulous. Um, ours is menzoo.org slash plant for pollinators. Um, and as I said, some of that outreach is really important and these are acting also as rain gardens. So there's dual benefits um, that we are, are able to help improve our own water quality. So even if you don't care about bees or, or butterflies or pollinators, I bet you're probably going to care about water quality. Um, and the, the dual benefits that, that Bob had talked about, with us, especially with those deep roots, helping to filter and, and, and stabilize uh, soils are really, really important for native plants. So one of these rain gardens that was just recently established, I think three years ago at the zoo, um, with, next to one of our exhibits is helping to highlight that. And one thing that, like I said, there's dual benefits. So um, focus in here in this orange square. You see that? Anybody figure out what that is? Right there, we got a pollinator. That's a rusty patch bumblebee. So this new, brand new pollinator garden that had been established at the zoo is now serving as a, as a site and a resource for endangered pollinators, uh, the endang these endangered species. So really happy to report now that we have a, uh, for the last couple of years that we've been looking intensively for them, we've, we've found rusty patch bumblebees on zoo site in those brand new gardens that we've been establishing. So 
this is one of the big lessons where you and other institutions that are especially um, in within the range and um, uniquely in the Twin Cities metro can really be having an impact um, in helping endangered species in your own yards. One thing that we need to be doing also then is, is understanding more about where they are and they, they aren't. Um, and so the Fish and Wildlife Service and many others are trying to implement um, citizen science applications to, to understand more about where a rusty patch bumblebee lives and, and the diversity of bumblebees in general. And so there's two great uh, citizen science programs out there, Bumblebee Watch and uh, through iNaturalist, there's a, there's a new program called Backyard Bumblebee Count. And those are really targeted towards, especially trying to find rusty patch, but really to understand everything else that's going on. So all it really takes is you take a picture of a bumblebee in your yard, you upload it to these two programs, and then they're cross-referenced and identified, and they go into national databases for diversity, including the Rusty Batch Bumblebee databases. So it's very cool. I encourage everybody to do that. And that's a nice thing to be doing when we are at home, um, you know, in, or anywhere you are. Um, so the, this feeds into my fourth thing, and that's is that engaging. Like I said, um, I'm a trained butterfly biologist, but I know that the science of it is, is not, can't be the only thing. We need to have individual contact with, with those that can be influencing and making, helping make decisions. And that, so that includes reaching out and, and talking with legislators and other policymakers. Those are really important connections to make. We know pollinators are then, you know, have a very strong, um, they're, they're a great gateway towards uh, learning about the natural world. Um, and so finding those connections through the, say, the Minneapolis Monarch Festival, which I sure hope happens, is able to happen this year in some form at least, um, or even just individual at one-on-one at -on -one scales is really, really important. So like I said, uh, find the influencers, find, find the, those that are, can help shape policy. So for example, with the the reintroduction efforts of Red Dakota Skippers. Basically, nobody's heard of Dakota Skippers before, but if I was able to bring out Sven Sungard from Carol Levin, and he was able to do live morning broadcasts doing the weather focus back into the Twin Cities, but that also do a great story about our, our butterfly program at the same time. That's the kind of visibility that's really going to have a lot of, uh, lot of sort of network impact. Finally, I'll add then that we need to be having engagement. Like I said, we need to be able to form those connections with the natural world. We don't get out enough. Very few people are ever going to go into a big vast prairie. Um, and that's really sad. It, it, it's the most endangered ecosystem in North America. And there are, we're, we're forgetting the names of common species. So foster those connections, young and old. So through collective actions, we really need to be forming those, those gains. So it, like I said, they're, they're, it's not just a single tool, it's gonna have to be a, a group effort. So um, through collective actions, we can, we can be hopeful to be making a difference for the pollinators. So at all ends, there are jewels in our backyards and it's up to us to try to one, recognize them and foster them. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's Earth Chapter. Thanks to Pollinator Friendly Alliance, our host, and Ramsey County Soil and Water, our co-host. If you have questions or inquiries, please contact pollinatorfriendly.org.